Chapter Seventeen of The Harbor of Doubt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Harbor of Doubt by Frank Williams. Chapter Seventeen Trawlers. Schofield stood as one stupefied, staring blankly at the fateful words. Murder in the first degree. Had it not been for his thorough knowledge of Nat Burns's character, he would have laughed at the absurdity of the thing and thrown the message over the side. But now he remained like one fast in the clutch of some horrible nightmare, unable to reason, unable to think coherently, unable to do anything but attempt to sound the depths of the hatred such as this. "'For heaven's sake, what is it, Skipper?' asked Ellenwood. Code passed the message to his mate without a word. His men might as well know the worst at once. Ellenwood read slowly. "'Rot!' he snarled in his great rumbling voice. "'Murder! How does he get murder out of it?' "'If I sank the old May Schofield for her insurance money, which is what everyone believes, then I deliberately caused the death of the men with me, didn't I? Pete, this is a pretty serious thing. I didn't care when they set the insurance company on me, but this is different. If it goes beyond this stage, I will carry the disgrace of jail and a trial all my life. That devil has nearly finished me. Code's voice broke and the tears of helpless rage smarted in his eyes. "'Steady on now,' counseled Pete, looking with pity at the young skipper he worshipped. "'He's done for you true this time, but the end of things is a tarn a long ways off yet, and don't you go losing your spunk.' "'But what have I ever done to him that he should start this against me?' cried Schofield. Pete could not answer. "'What do they do when a man is accused of murder?' asked Code. "'Why, arrest him, I guess.' Pete scratched his chin reminiscently. "'There was that Bulwer case.' He recounted it in detail. "'Yes,' he went on. "'They can't do nothing until the man accused is arrested.' After that he gets a preliminary hearing, and if things seem plain enough, then the grand jury indicts him. After that he's tried by a regular jury. So the fust thing they've got to do is arrest you. Darn it, they shan't. I'll sail to Africa first, snarled Code, his eyes blazing. He strode up and down the deck. You say the word, Skipper rumbled Pete loyally, and we crack on every stitch for the North Pole. Code smiled. Curse me if I don't like to see a man smile when he's in trouble, announced Pete roundly. Skipper, you'll do. You're young, and these things come hard, but I calculate we'll drop all this talk about sailing away to foreign parts. Now, there's just two courses left for you to sail. Either we go on fishing and dodge the gunboat that brings the officer after you, or we go on fishing and let him get you when he comes. I'll stand by you either way. You've got your mother to support, God bless her, and you've got a right to fill your hold with fish so she can live when they're sold. That's one way of looking at it. The other's plain sailing. No, Pete, this is too serious. I guess the mother'll have to suffer this time, too. If they send a man after me, I'll be here and I'll go back and take my medicine. I'll make you skipper and you can select your mate. You'll get a skipper's share and you can pay mother the regular amount for hiring the lass. "'She'll get Skipper's share if I have to lick every hand aboard,' growled Ellenwood. "'And you can rest easy on that.' "'That's fine,' 
said Code gently. And I don't know what I'd do without you, Pete. You ain't supposed to do without me. What in thunder do you suppose I shipped with you fur, if it wasn't to look after you, eh? The men had finished dressing down and were cleaning up the decks. Several of them, noticing that something momentous was being discussed, were edging nearer. Pete observed this. "'Skipper,' he said, "'we've got four or five shots of trawl line to pick. Suppose you and I go out and do the job. Then we can talk in peace. Feel able?' "'Never better in my life. Get my dory over.' "'That blue one? Never again. That's bad luck for you. Take mine.' "'All right. Anything you say.' Several hands made the dory ready. Into it they put three or four tubs or half-casks, in which was coiled hundreds of fathoms of stout line furnished with a strong hook every two or three feet. Each hook was baited with a fat salt clam, for the early catch of squid had been exhausted by the dory fishing. There was also a fresh tub of bait, buoys, and a lantern. A youth aboard clambered up to the cross-trees, gave them the direction of the trawl buoy light, and they started. It was a clear, starlit night, with only a gentle sea running, and no wind to speak of. There was not a hint of fog. The charming lass lay now in the Atlantic approximately along the 46th parallel, near its intersection with the 55th of Meridian or eighty to a hundred miles southwest of Cape Race, Newfoundland, and almost an equal distance southeast of the Miquelon Islands, France's sole remaining territorial possession in the New World. Code and Ellenwood easily found their trawl buoy by the glimmer of the light across the water. They immediately began to plant the trawl lines in the tubs aboard the dory. The big buoy for the end of the line they first anchored to the bottom with dory roding. Then, as Ellenwood rowed slowly, Code paid the baited trawl line out of the tubs. As there are hooks every few feet, so are there big wooden buoys, so that the whole length of the line, sometimes twenty-five hundred feet, is floated near the surface. When the last had been paid out, a second anchor and large buoy was fixed, and their trawl was set. Next they turned their attention to picking the trawl already in the water. As the line came over the starboard gunwale, Code picked the fish off the hooks, passing the hooks to Pete, who baited them and threw them over the port gunwale. Thus they would work their way along the whole of the line. Many of the hooks that came to Code's hands still had the bait with which they were set. "'Must be the bait,' he told Ellenwood. "'The fish won't touch it. This is no catch for five shots of trawl.' But Pete could not cast any light on the subject. It was certainly true that the catch from the trawl line was small enough to be remarkable, but the men were helpless to explain the reason. For two hours they worked along the great line. "'There's a bare chance that the message from the unknown schooner might be a fake, although I can't imagine why,' said Code, as they were returning. "'But if it is not, and the Canadian gunboat comes after me, she'll find me here, willing to go back to St. Andrews and answer all charges. "'No escape and no dodging this time.' And let me tell you something, Pete. If nothing comes out of this except ugly rumor that I have to suffer for, I'm going to quit minding my own business, and I'll dig up something that'll drive Nat Burns out of Freekirk Head forever. A man of his character and nature has certainly got something he doesn't want known, and I shall bring it to light and make it so public that he'll wish he had never heard the name Schofield. 
By heaven, I've reached the end of my patience. If there was anything Pete Ellenwood loved, it was a fight, and at this declaration of war he roared encouragement. You'll do, Skipper, you'll do. Get after him. Climb his frame. Put him out of business. And let me help you. That's all I want. Everything in good time, Pete, grinned Code. First, we've got to find out how much of this is in the wind and how much is not. Arrived at the schooner, they pitched their fish into the pen for the first watch to dress and rolled aft for the night. Code took off his coat and drew forth the packet that Elsa had given him, looked at it for a moment, and threw it upon the table. "'Why in time did she send me that?' he asked himself, his voice very near disgust. "'It must have looked mighty strange to Nell for me to be getting money from Elsa Mallaby.' He stopped short in the midst of pulling off one boot. The idea had never struck him forcibly before. Now it seemed evident that Nellie's reserve might have been due to the letter. "'What a fool I was not to tell her about it!' he cried. With one boot off, he reached across to the packet under the swinging lamp and drew the letter out of it and read, Dear partner, here is something that Captain Bijona will hand to you when he catches the lass. There are supposed to be one hundred and fifty dollars in this packet. I never was much of a counter, as you know. Now, dear friend, this isn't all for you, unless you need it. It is simply a small reserve fund for the men of the fleet if they should need anything. A new gaff, for instance, or a jib or grub. It isn't much, but you never can tell when it might come in handy. It was your good scheme that sent the men off fishing, and you left the way open for me to do my little part here at the head. Now I want to do just this much more for the sailors of the fleet, and I am asking you to be my treasurer. When you hear of a needy case, just give him what you think he needs and say it is a loan from me if he won't take a gift. If this is a trouble to you, I am sorry, but we are all working for the good name and the good times of Grand Mignon, and I hope you won't mind. Good fishing to the charming lass, high line and topping full. May you wet your salt early and come home again to those who are longing to see you. This is all done on the spur of the moment, so I have no time to ask your mother to enclose a line. But I know she sends her love. It has been a little hard for her here since you left, bless her heart. But she has been as brave as a soldier, and helped me very much. We see a great deal of each other, and you can rest assured I shall look after her. Always your old friend, Elsa. As Code read the last paragraph, his eyes softened. It was white of Elsa to look after his mother, particularly now when there would be much for her to face regarding himself. And it was white of her to send the money for the sailors of the fleet. Even she did not know, as Code did, how nearly destitute some of the dorymen were. He would be glad to do what little work there might be in dispersing the sum. "'Sorry Nellie didn't seem interested when I began to talk about Elsa,' he said to himself. "'I suppose I should have told her anyway, so there wouldn't be any misunderstanding. Well, I'll do it next time.' He turned the lamp low and rolled into his bunk. End of chapter 17 Recording by Roger Moline